In this video, an extraordinary relationship between the prime numbers and the zeros of the Riemann zeta function is visualized and explained. On the one hand side, it is probably the most inefficient way to calculate the prime property of numbers. On the other hand side, it is at least for me an amazing relation. How on earth is it possible that the prime property of discrete numbers is encoded into the zeros of a smooth complex function? If you want to join in for a few highlights on this remarkable journey, crossing the bridge between number theory and complex analysis, just stay with me for a few minutes. I don't want to drag you up a hill and take the risk to lose most of you on the way. Therefore, we'll start at the top with a spectacular view and an amazing insight, and you can thereafter decide how much of the results you want to have verified and explained in greater detail. So here's the full picture. There is a prime counting function denoted by Psi, which looks rather peculiar at first sight. It has steps at every prime number and at every power of a prime. It is probably not the kind of function that you usually consider in school. However, the amazing point is that you can express this function in terms of a single variable x, much like other functions that you've encountered in school. In a first approximation, this function Psi grows like a linear function x. It fits even better when it is shifted slightly by a small constant, roughly 0.8, that happens to be equal to the logarithm of 2 pi. And now, keep your breath, by adding infinitely many more terms of the form x to the power of one particular number, divided by this number, we can almost exactly match the behavior of the Psi function. One tiny little further correction should be added, if you want to trace the form of the Psi function perfectly. Now you can ask, where do all these terms come from? And then I can tell you that all these different contributions originate from features of a complex function, the so-called Riemann zeta function. The linear term belongs to the pole of this zeta function, the rows are the location of the so-called non-trivial zeros, and the tiny correction is due to the trivial zeros of the zeta function. And this outlines the topics that are covered in this video. First, the Psi function is explained and motivated as a prime counting function. Secondly, we will talk about zeros and poles of real and complex functions. The third part deals with the Riemann zeta function, and in the last part, a rather formal verification of the result is presented. If you want to build a bridge between prime numbers and functions, you first have to somehow turn the prime property of a number into a function. This is achieved by a so-called prime counting function, and the simplest of it is commonly named pi of x. It just counts the number of primes that are smaller than a given input value x. For x equal 80, for instance, you will get the answer 22, because there are 22 primes smaller than 80. If this is repeated for all values of x, one finds a step function whose value increases by 1 whenever you hit a prime. Riemann introduced a slightly different prime counting function, labeled with a capital Pi. It does not only step up when x is prime, but also whenever x is a power of a prime. The step size is 1 at the position of primes, 1 half at squares of primes, 1 third at cubes, and so on. This prime counting function played a major role in my first video on this topic, which the keen among you are recommended to watch as well. The link is in the top right corner and it can be found in the video description. In this video, a third prime counting function denoted with the Greek letter Psi is the function of choice. It steps up at every prime value and at values that are powers of primes, much like Riemann's prime counting function. However, the step size is always given by the logarithm of the corresponding prime, no matter whether it is a prime or a power of a prime. Two step sizes are shown in the diagram as explanation. At 31, the step size is the logarithm of 31, since it is a prime number. At 32, however, the step size is the logarithm of 2, since 32 can be expressed as the fifth power of 2. Although it is not very intuitive at first sight, this function can be used to determine the property of an unknown number x. If the exponential of the step size is equal to x, then x must be a prime number. If the exponential of the step size is another prime, then x must be a power of this particular prime. And if the exponential of the step size is 1, then x is a composite number. 
Interestingly, as you've seen, this function on average grows linearly and it can be expressed by the zeros of the zeta function in a very elementary fashion. In the second part of this video, we'll highlight the importance of zeros. It turns out that for smooth functions, the position of the zeros largely determines the shape of the function everywhere. Moreover, functions can be built from simple building blocks that are identified with the zeros of the function. Let's start with a simple example that everyone knows from school. The function f of x equals 1 is a constant function that has no zeros at all. If this function is multiplied by x, a zero is introduced at the position x equal to zero. Two additional factors can be used to generate zeros at x equal to 1 and x equal to minus 1. This is up to rescaling the only polynomial function of degree 3 that has zeros at these three locations. Next, additional factors are introduced to generate zeros at x equal 2 and minus 2, at x equal 3 and minus 3, and so on. It is natural to ask what function one ends up when a factor is introduced for every integer. Hopefully it's not a big surprise that one ends up with the sine function. You have to add infinitely many terms, however, since the sine function has infinitely many zeros. The same construction principle can be generalized to complex functions. Let's quickly introduce the notion of a complex function in comparison to a real function. A real function is a map from a real x value into another value usually denoted with y or f of x. This map is shown here for the function y is equal to x squared minus 1. This map can be represented by a tabular display of values or even nicer by a graph in a two-dimensional coordinate system. Every point on the graph corresponds to a pair of x and y, or in other words, to one particular mapping of the function. A complex function is a map from a complex set value into another complex value, here denoted with w. In the animation, the same function w equals z squared minus 1 now maps points of the left complex plane into points of the right complex plane. Observe that the origin of the second plane is met twice, which corresponds to the two zeros of the function at z equal to 1 and minus 1. A graph that represents this function would require a four-dimensional coordinate system. Due to the shortage of dimensions in our world, it is common to only represent the distance of the image point from its origin as height. The direction in a complex plane is only color-coded. Two important colors are red for positive values and light blue for negative values. All other colors smoothly interpolate between positive and negative values. This reduced information can be represented in one three-dimensional coordinate system. The horizontal plane represents the complex input values of the function. The height is a measure for the absolute value and the color indicates the face value of the image point. This way the full information of the function can be stored inside a two-dimensional surface. The more familiar real part of the function is captured in the shape of the surface along the real axis. When the light blue part is flipped below the real axis, the familiar shape of the real function is restored. Let's now have a look how the zero building blocks work for complex functions. We start with the constant function f of z equals to pi. It is multiplied by z to create the first zero at the origin. The additional factors introduce zeros at 1 and minus 1. If factors for each integer are multiplied, one ends up with a complex version of the sine function. And the familiar real part of the function is again recovered along the real axis. If only colors are considered, it's nice to see that there's always a full rotation of faces around each zero. Each zero is a special point where there is no information of direction available. Besides zeros, there is a second kind of building block that introduces another kind of special points, so-called poles. In this example, there is a pole located at x equal 2. Poles are generated with similar terms, but this time they appear in the denominator. For convenience, the term can be rewritten as a factor with a negative exponent. If focused only on the real part, these poles appear to be rather disruptive discontinuities. But once the full complex function is considered, there is a continuum of face values 
that smoothly interpolates between the positive and the negative value. And if we included the point of infinity to the complex numbers, the function would be well behaved everywhere. Much like in the case of zeros, further poles can be introduced by corresponding factors and they can be combined with zeros. Illustratively speaking, the special points are the only places of undefined faces. Therefore, all colors meet at these points. Everywhere else, the phase structure of the function is determined by the location of these special points. You can see in the next part that also the zeta function is essentially determined by its pole and its trivial and non-trivial zeros. In its most accessible definition, the zeta function is usually defined as a sum of inverse powers of all positive integers. For large values of z, the function is rather boring since it will be dominated by the first term. Interesting behavior starts to occur for real values of z close to 1. Since the harmonic series, the sum of all inverse positive integers, diverges, the definition can only be used to calculate values of zeta for z values with the real part larger than 1. And at 1, a pole appears when all terms of the sum are included. A small trick is used to find the values of the zeta function between 0 and 1. Both sides of the defining equation are multiplied with the following expression. And then the terms on the right hand side are rearranged such that every other term flips its sign. By construction, the term with even integers are now negative. Therefore, the sum is converted into an alternating series. With this trick, the zeta function can be calculated also on the critical strip between 0 and 1, where the function shows a very rich structure with infinitely many randomly scattered zeros. It is Riemann's hypothesis, whose proof is worth $1 million, that all of these zeros are located on the critical line with real part one half. By virtue of a functional equation, zeta can be calculated everywhere on the complex plane. And additional zeros appear for every even negative integer. For much more details on this continuation, I highly recommend the video series by the YouTuber Zetamath, which is linked above and in the video description. For what follows, the important features of the zeta function are summarized. There is a pole at z equal to 1 and trivial zeros at every negative integer value. The non-trivial zeros are located on the critical line and the precise location can only be computed numerically. Interestingly, similar to the sine function, the zeta function can be expressed as a product of linear terms, where each of the terms corresponds to a zero or the pole at z equal to one. The following animation shows how the zeta function is approached when more and more zeros are taken into account. The first step is a function that only consists of a pole at z equal to one. Thereafter, the non-trivial zeros are added step by step. When the terms for the trivial zeros are added, a few additional terms are introduced for convergence. They do not add special points and they are unimportant for the calculation of the Psi function later on. Now it's time to put all things together. In my first video on this topic, it was shown that the logarithm of the zeta function can be expressed as an integral, including Riemann's prime counting function. This integral expression is a hidden Fourier transformation that is also known as Mellin transform. It is invertible and the prime counting function can be expressed in terms of the zeta function. In the last video we stopped at this point and only heuristically argued that the zeros of the zeta function are crucial for the evaluation of the integral, since the logarithm turns them into simple poles that are the pearls for complex integration. This time it's easy to go one step further. If the derivative of the logarithm of the zeta function is considered instead, almost identical calculations can be repeated with the result that this time the Psi function appears inside the integral. By virtue of the Mellin transform, the equation can be inverted again. This time it's worth to perform the integration. The product representation of the zeta function turns out to be the representation of choice. The logarithm turns the infinite product into a sum with infinitely many terms. The resulting expression can be differentiated rather straightforwardly. The result simplifies enormously when its value at zero is removed. One ends up with three contributions. 
one from the pole, one from the trivial and one from the non-trivial zeros of the zeta function. The value at zero is actually known, it is the logarithm of 2 pi. At this point we are almost at the finish line. The expression is substituted back into the integral. The integration can be performed. These are known integrals that are found in the lookup tables for the Mellon transforms. We end with the result stated at the beginning of this video. By the way, there is no spooky action needed to calculate these integrals. All integrals of this kind are usually calculated as complex contour integrals. There is a great series on YouTube by the YouTuber QN Cubed that explains hundreds of such integrals. This series is also linked in the top right corner and in the video description. Once you've watched a few of them, you can tackle these integrals quite easily. A few steps of this contour integration are outlined for the contribution of one non-trivial zero. In the first step, the variable of integration is shifted by the position of the zero. This allows to take the power of x to a row out of the integral. In the term inside, the integral now has a simple pole at the origin. The path of integration is parallel to the imaginary axis. The parameter a is arbitrary but larger than 1. Therefore, even after the subtraction of rho, the path still runs to the right of the pole. The power x to the s is re-expressed as an exponential. Now when x is smaller than 1, the logarithm is negative and the path of the integration can be closed outside the pole. Therefore, the entire integral vanishes. For x larger than 1, however, the path has to be closed around the pole, which generates a factor 2 pi i and confirms the result of the Mellon transform. Let's have one more look at the individual contributions to the Psi function. As stated at the beginning, the overall shape of the Psi function is obtained from the location of the pole at z equal to 1. It is therefore tightly related to the divergence of the harmonic series. The contribution from the trivial zeros can be summarized into a closed form, which can be ignored for large x and it is only needed to restore the shape of the Psi function between 1 and 2. The contribution from the non-trivial zeros by itself is an oscillating function. The amplitude of the oscillation is bounded by the square root of x. By the way, this is the only statement that relies on the truth of the Riemann hypothesis. All other results stated here are valid completely independent of the precise location of the non-trivial zeros. When more and more terms are added, these oscillations turn into a sawtooth-like shape. The negative slope exactly balances the contribution from the pole and the jumps just trace the appearance of the primes and the powers of primes. This concludes the correspondence between prime numbers and the zeros of the zeta function. If all zeros of the zeta function were known, the prime counting function psi could be calculated exactly. Imagine that the third part of the psi function could be summed up similarly easily as it is in the case of the trivial zeros. One would have a closed expression for psi and with it one could calculate the prime property of every number. Aside from this wishful thinking, to me it is really fascinating how the properties of integer numbers are encoded in the zeros of the zeta function much like a symphony of Beethoven is encoded in a sequence of tones for various instruments. Because in the end, the prime counting function is effectively represented as a Fourier integral, where the zeros of the zeta function are the keys to the harmonics. If you made it to this point, you should consider subscribing to not miss possible follow-ups. That's all for now. I'm curious to hear your comments. See you next time. Bye-bye.